right, my name's Dale, I'm a grazer. Um, that's, a, that's a confession and a fact. So um, how many of you are living the dream right now grazing? All right, how many of you are dreaming about living the dream for grazing? Okay, good, so we've got some, got some people who are at the very beginning of their journey. So um, Mary asked me to uh, talk about lessons learned for grazers. Um, and since I'm uh, relatively new, new to grazing, although you couldn't tell from my gray hair, um, this sort of a uh, profession change for me, worked indoors for a number of years and decided I wanted to be outdoors where the sunshine is and live a healthier life. And that's one of, the, I think, one of the motivating factors for a lot of us who choose this lifestyle um, is to live healthier. And through grazing, we can only not only live healthier for ourselves, but we can make a healthier environment for our animals and for the world and for our customers who consume our products. So it's really a rewarding, um, really a rewarding profession to get into uh, if you choose it. So I encourage you to do that. I did bring my hat. Um, Kevin did mention it's still winter, I guess. So we're going to have a spring solstice here pretty soon, the 21st, I think it is. But uh, this morning I looked out at my pasture, we're bale grazing and it looked like blizzard. So um, I thank you all for coming out and, and uh, braving the Wisconsin almost spring. Um, so please, if you have questions, um, raise them. Uh, <clears throat> and this is by no means a recipe for anybody else on their farm. Uh, what I've learned through the pasture walks and walking, working with other people, that every farm has got different resource constraints and goals and um, a familiar term you may have heard from um, listening to uh, some of the greats in our, in our industry. They talk about context and context is where you're at in your grazing career and your grazing start. So uh, context is important and uh, you'll hear that uh, from other people as well. So, here are seven areas we're going to talk about uh, for lessons learned. And um, <clears throat> I also found um, this in Progressive Farmer this month. And I would recommend this is another lessons learned. It's a four page article about um, all, what all of us sort of face. And I think these are good principles to start off with. Um, you know, and I, I do mention this a little bit, I do touch on it, and that is uh, establish. A calving season. Um, trying, you know, I think what helps is not to have calves three or four times a year or winter calves. Um, you know, you don't want to go out and, and find a calf in the pasture and try to bring it into the house and warm it up. If you can calve while you're while the spring flush is going, that's wonderful. Um, then uh, the author talks about a crossbreed advantage. I won't be copying that today. I do think it's important to know your costs and establish a grazing program. We'll be, that's the focus of today and, and some of the things we'll talk about. And then finally, um, this didn't occur to me in my talk, but it is something, if you're direct marketing, be a price maker, not a price taker. So what that means is we're looking to establish relationships with our customers rather than sell, sending our animals to an auction someplace where whatever price that comes back to us is what the price that we take. So whether it be beef or lamb or, I was gonna say chickens, but I got chickens on the mind. I don't think there are any chicken auctions anywhere. That might be something new to think about, but probably not. So here's our operation. We're 100% grass fed um, operation with uh, Hereford beef. They're a larger animal. Um, and <clears throat> we also do pastured poultry. Our, our chickens are out on pasture for at least half their life. We move them around every day to fresh grass and bugs. And they love crickets and grasshoppers. And I've had so much chicken now, I can tell what chicken comes from what time of the year. You wouldn't think there'd be a difference, but it really depends what they're eating. You know? uh, we chill tank tenderize our chickens too, which is a selling point for us at farmer's markets. It, makes, it gives us a competitive advantage. Uh, where customers, once they have this chicken, because you can't get it in the grocery store, uh, <clears throat> it's an older technique of when the chickens are being processed, they are dressed and then put into a big chill tank overnight with a refrigerator. Keeps the water at a specific temperature. A lot of chicken processors today are paid by the quantity that they get through. And so what they're trying to do is get from the loading dock to the freezer as fast as possible. Well. My guy stops 
um, and he puts them in a tank after they've been dressed out, that allows the muscles to relax. And when you freeze a muscle and it's relaxed, you have a tender chicken. If you freeze a tight muscle, that's where tough meat comes from, and I can talk more about that, and actually talk more about than I expected to, but that's part of the spiel, and we'll talk about that um, later on in the presentation when we're talking about direct marketing to find out what's important to your customers. Then um, we also have been using um, commercial lean pigs. We raise them out on pasture and we finish them differently than you could find any place else. I would say um, don't produce a commodity product if you don't want a commodity price. In other words, specialize, find a niche, right, and market that. You, the customers will come to you um, who are looking for that, who, are, who are, um, are interested in those types of products. Uh, we do do rotational grazing, and, and I do joke, this is Mrs. Farmer's Sherry. Um, that's my wife, Mrs. Farmer. And um, you can see that uh, we do uh, uh, periodic, graze, uh, periodic moves with our grazing, and that's just above Bull Moose Lake. And, uh, <clears throat> we're uh, located in Russ County. Some of the other things that we do that are different is that we have a hydroponic system that we use in our sprout in our sprout room. It's the old pump house attached to the barn. And you can see there that um, this is a picture from uh, a year before. And uh, the green stuff is the, is the plant, and the white stuff is the roots. And the animals love it. And I'll tell you that I did a, I did a quick study. Uh, and we, last year, we weaned in. Um, on January 1st, so I weighed, the, I weighed the animals January 1, weighed them again on January 31, these are the calves, and I had an, an average, um, I had a, a, a average daily gain between three and five pounds. Now the, the five pound um, animal, the calf, you know, right, this is during the most stressful time for that calf, you know, we've, we've separated it from its milk supply, right, and uh, physically separated it. We do uh, something called fence line weaning, which allows the calf and the cow to see each other, and I think that helps. This year we did something different where we, um, we weaned uh, basically after the, the, the cows had stopped their production of, of milk, and I think that helps, so we kept them until February. Um, <clears throat> all right, so this is a, a, a standout feature for us, and it allows us to not lose weight gain on calves during weaning. Um, our customers seem to enjoy the idea that we have a sprout room or using hydroponics and that we're not feeding grain. You know, we're 100% grass fed um, through, the, through the period. Some of our other practices are we outwinter and that first picture that you see on the left side is uh, where we unrolled bales. This year we adopted bale grazing and we'll speak about that shortly. We also target for spring calving. The reason for that is we're trying to find the natural rhythm and the natural cycle. Um, we're trying to target right around when those fawns are dropping. Um, that helps us with any predation problems. And we do have wolf track and coyotes and um, all the predators out there. It's almost a natural reserve where we are. We're in between the confluence of the Flambeau and Chippewa rivers. And it seems to be like a, like a natural preserve because we have bear, we see them, we've got fishers, we've got raccoons, we've got skunks, and they're all waking, the skunk is waking up. Well, skunk woke up a couple weeks ago, so. Um, and then um, also uh, you can see some of our other practices there I won't dwell on. This is one of our key marketing points and it makes superior chicken is that we have our chickens out on pasture and like I mentioned, we move them every day to fresh grass and bugs and of course for chill tank tenderized, which I've already talked about. I give feedback to my, my nursery, or my hatchery, where, the, where the, our chicks come from, so that we can get the best genetics, right, um, for, our, for our production and for our customers. And um, we use a, um, a, a nursery, I keep saying nursery, a hatchery in Wisconsin out of Waterloo. Um, <clears throat> so some more of our practices are uh, we uh, keep the chickens indoors in a brooder uh, until they get feathers and they're they have enough to be outdoors. And uh, we also added duck eggs this year. There's a picture of our pastured pork. The pork, uh, the pigs come in May and then they come off uh, right around Halloween. And this is just the day before they went to market. That year we finished them on pumpkins. This year we finished them on apples. Um, and a little bit more about the, about the pigs. 
So uh, one of the things that, as a new grazer, we, we took and we converted what had been decades long of row crop um, rented cropland. So there had been several different um, uh, producers there uh, over the years, and the contracts were short, so there wasn't a lot of effort done on improving the soil. And um, this is our seeding that we made in uh, 2019, and we got a lot of rain that year, but you can see that there, you can still see our drill rows in between. And that's a, a sort of resource constraint that we've been, we've been working with. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk about uh, what some of, the, some of the things that uh, we're doing to approach that. So on the pasture, um, for lessons learned that we've had, we've got um, uh, several categories here. One is um, seeding, and the, based on the picture you just saw, right, I, I used an old drill and old equipment, I put it in myself. Um, I would recommend that you do a crisscross pattern. Now, for the veteran farmers out there, that is a kind of a natural thing, but for someone who's starting up, you know, um, that's, that's not entirely obvious. So if you're starting and you're gonna put new seeding in, I'd suggest you do a crisscross. Um, and we did very light tillage uh, before that, and um, the year before it was, uh, uh, it was soybeans, and then soybeans the year before that with some stubble on the field, not much. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, what's important to get seed establishment is to have seed to soil contact. And um, I see some of you are making notes. I'll be happy to share this to you if you give me your email address um, and you can have it. Um, also, we've been practicing with uh, frost seeding. Um, and uh, I thought last year that I had frost seeding nailed um, because I got there just that, that period of time where the snow was gone, but it was still, would get wet, you know, the sun would heat up the earth and it would um, get wet and then freeze at night. And that freeze thaw action is supposed to bring the seeds in. But um, I did not have uh, a good result from my frost seeding last year. And I believe it's because I'm on sand. Um, so this year we're gonna try frost drilling uh, some of our uh, legumes in there because our pasture now we're uh, into the cycle a few years so our red clover, our legume um, component of our pasture has been dying off, falling off. Um, we have been in a drought area for the last two years and actually last year when I was here I spoke about drought and, and shared a picture of the University of Lincoln, Nebraska, UNL. It's a drought monitor. I recommend you go out there and watch it. We're happily not in drought at this time. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to continue that throughout the year, I hope. Um, but I did speak about using crabgrass because uh, cr crabgrass will grow in a drought environment and it has a high level of protein through its entire life cycle. I tried to intercede grab crabgrass. I can tell you, don't do that. Uh, crabgrass wants to be a monoculture. And if you're interested in that, there is a uh, a rancher uh, up by Rice Lake that I would, I would um, recommend you talk to about who, how he does it. He's been working with the University of Wisconsin out of River Falls and he's established a really great program. So ask me later about that, I'll give you the contact information. Something early um, that, I, that I did um, is I wanted to have fly control. I saw there was gonna be a, quite a bit of pressure on my animals for flies. So I went out there and started dragging the pads. Well, while it cut down on the flies, right, it also cut down on the ability of my dung beetles. So I kind of set my dung beetles back. You want dung beetles, it's one of the beneficial insects that are out there. Um, and uh, I set them back. So here's, uh, here's something that I learned. Don't, don't drag them. If you're gonna drag them, wait at least three days. Um, but uh, you, should, uh, you should be able to, as a good measure of organic matter and microbiological life, and insects, those pats should disintegrate by themselves. And there are farmers here that can tell you about that um, and how they've seen it. I have been working with establishing a forage chain and what that is is a topic where I can have living um, uh, grasses for the animals to eat as, and extend my, my, my season as much as possible. So what I've been doing is I've been putting cereal rye in um, in August, September in my calving area, which is about five acres we use for calving, and it's a specially fenced area to keep the wolves and coyotes out, but I notice the fox just goes straight through underneath it, so um, 
I, I don't know how well it's going to be a, a, a deterrent, but we haven't lost any calves to wolves or, or coyotes. Uh, <clears throat> but the forage chain is, I'll start with cereal rye. Let me just check the time here. I've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, cereal rye to pearl millet. And I finish on pearl millet. And for me, with my resource constraints, I'm on sand and it's dry and the pearl millet does really well. And, and the pearl millet offers us a high degree of carbohydrates and sugar, and that's what we need to build fat on the animals. And so I've gotten really good feedback from people who've purchased quarters and halves from us about the fat content on our just over two-year-old animals. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, stockmanship, you'd probably laugh, uh, this is something to uh, enjoy a laugh on, is our first year out there, we'd go out there and count our calves, and we'd be short calves, and so we'd be looking for these calves on almost 80 acres, and the grass is about this tall. And they lay down, they were invisible. It would have been nice to have a drone at that point in time, but my wife and I would go out there looking for these calves, and looking for these calves, and then we'd chase them back in with mom. And it became a quite, a, quite an event and an exercise program for us until we talked to some other people and they're like, don't worry about those calves, they'll come back. Uh, they'll come back to mom when they're hungry. And you're probably wondering well, where they're going. Well, we've got a poly wire, you know, it's a single strand, and the calves go underneath it. They're still contained within our, within our farm, but they go out and they hide and um, they'll eat some of the best stuff. Then when they're hungry, they'll come back. Um, so. If you want an exercise program, you can go out and chase your calves, but you know, I'd say save that energy for something else. Uh, the other point uh, I've learned, this is a, an expensive one, is last year, and it didn't happen just to me, but it happened to another producer in my region, where the, we've got poly wire, and um, the poly wire is thin, and the poly tape is thicker. And last year we had an animal get his leg wrapped around, all the way around, and it lacerated all the way to the bone. And I had to go out there in the pasture and take care of that. Well, we, we recovered the animal and we, we slaughtered them early. So we had a young animal and we shared that with the family that bought it, um, that it was young. But I was really happy that uh, it, there was some good fat laid in there. It was a yearling and uh, we butchered on, on pasture and I was able to see where the fat was and the, our customers were real happy about that. Uh, so another producer had the same issue, and so what I'm doing is I'm moving from poly wire that has a tensile strength, you know, of thousands of pounds to break to tape that's just a few hundred pounds and it's wider. And the reason I'm doing that is when I think about it, if they break out of the paddock that I have them in, they're still in my containment area. I'd rather have them out eating in, the, in an area that I hadn't planned for yet, then have to deal with another laceration on the leg. So that's why I'm moving. That's kind of a long point, but um, some of you may have to face that. And if you, and if you don't then from this talk, then that's made your visit worthwhile today. So bale grazing. Um, we are working on bale grazing for um, the resource constraints that you can see up there. And one of our resource constraints is we need to boost our soil fertility because we basically have subsoil on top, very little, very little if any topsoil. And so we put out over 300 bales this winter um, and it's been working really well. Uh, this, there's been so much snow this year and then that rain um, sort of encrusted it and packed it down. So we've got about a two foot pack um, and almost three foot pack. And with that, the animals are no longer getting to ground. Um, to get an electric shock. So you can talk, I'm sure Randy's got a, an idea on how to fix that. Um, what we did is we ran a neutral line and a hot line, um, and they'd already learned how to disrespect that line the yearlings had. So we didn't have much luck with that, but the cows, they learned it, they, they hate electricity. So even when it's not charged, they don't challenge it. But the kids do, so. Um, for those of you who have teenagers, you probably understand that. Uh, okay, so the bales are placed in November. Here's some quick tips. Take the net wrap and the twine off. If you do it, you'll thank me later. Otherwise, you're out there you know, fighting an iced, an, an iced, you know, two inches of ice and net wrap, and it'll become a career for you. Um, <clears throat> I am going to do a soil test this year. I didn't get a soil test year, uh, last year out there. My soil test is from four years ago. So another thing that I've learned is, um, there is really a thing called pig-headedness, and I learned where it came from. Some of you who have had pigs or swine have probably already realized this, but 
Um, when you get your pigs and you're going to pasture them, you've got to train them to electric fence. So you're going to put them into a small area and have them get a shock. Because um, if you don't do that, what will happen is they'll go up to that, that strand, or two, and we use two, two actually wide tape, and then we have a dedicated fencer for that. They'll go through it, even though they're getting shocked, because they're pig-headed. They'll just keep going straight. So you've got to train them. That's one of the things that we learned. And then also, um, uh, we, we take our pigs, we load our pigs up early in the morning. Uh, one morning we were out there at 4 o'clock and we built a makeshift um, corral for them. And the last pig, you never want a last pig because the last pig doesn't want to do anything you want that pig to do. And um, that's another really important tip. So you only take two things away. That's the second one today. Um, and I got a story about that, but we're running out of time. So beef handling. Um, <clears throat> If you're a grazer and you have animals out on, pad on paddock and you've got to do something to a do a treatment or a check on an animal um, and you can't bring them back, right? These mobile panels, they're 10 feet long. There's, you know, they're made out of metal tubes. They're probably 80, 120 pounds each. And um, what we did is we, we put them up along the fence, electric fence, and then we'd bring the whole herd up and we'd run them through and then we'd capture the ones that we need. And that works really well if you've got to do something. So I'd suggest invest. If, you, if, you're not, if you don't have a portable corral, get three or four of these panels and make a, make a U or an L to capture them. Um, and then I suggest go on pasture walks and see what other people are doing and learn from that. Um, all right, for you direct marketers out there, I wanted to have a label on my pork called pastured pork. Well, Here's something that I didn't know, but I learned the hard way. So here's for you to learn from me. And that is, I want to say pastured pork. Well, there's no reference for the Wisconsin food scientist um, who was new, who reviewed, who reviewed our request. And she said, I can't label it pastured pork. But I will label it, if you can see it over there, and here's my little pointer, never confined to a feedlot. That doesn't sound like pastured pork, does it? Uh, it's not as appetizing, but that's the labeling we got. So work with your, work with your, um, your butcher, your processor, and go read on these items before you make a claim, make a request to have something put on your label. Um, I think that's really important. And also, you can't just show up at a farmer's market and sell meat. For those of you who are starting off, you have to be licensed. And there are different licenses that you need to, need to get. Um, we'll spend a little more time on that one-on-one. -on -one. You can approach me uh, and we'll talk about that. So direct marketing. Um, I've seen uh, farmers come to farmers markets, put a table out in a chair and plop down and sit there and expect people to come up and buy their meat. Um, that, as I have seen, doesn't work well. What works better is if you are able to engage your customer. So first of all, you have to know what's important to your customer. Um, why do they come to the market, right? Um, why should they buy your product? So in this is where you differentiate your product as it's not a commodity, it's healthier, this is how I produce it, um, and, and uh, then they can fill in the blank of why it costs more. Because you'll never be able to compete, at least I haven't, and my friends aren't able to compete on the commodity pricing of chicken. You know, you go to the supermarket, it's 29 cents a pound. We're selling breasts for 9.95 a pound. So um, it, it all makes a difference on, on the production method and what you're doing. So um, <clears throat> have a quick spiel. You heard my spiel earlier. I was talking about how our chickens are out on pasture. They move them around every day to fresh grass and bugs. And it produces a healthier meat. And we chill tank tenderize and leave it at that. And then customers will say, oh, what's chill tank tenderized? So then I've got the follow on question where I'm not lecturing. You get it done and you get your opening done in 10, 15 seconds. And then they ask you the follow on question if it's important to them. If it's not important to them, then you, know, you didn't waste your time or their time. Uh, and then know your market. I'm going to say I've been in a lot of farmers markets and not all farmers markets are good markets for you. Uh, you, need to, you need to find out more about that market before you spend the gas and the time to go there. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I, I'm a large believer in this, and I'll spend just a minute or two on this. And that is, in the markets that I've been in, there are several other meat providers, and they have different methods of production. And I would say rule number one is don't say, I mean, this is double negative, so don't say bad things or negative things about another producer at a farmer's market. 
okay, they have a different method of production and they'll have a different customer base than you. How will you raise your animals and decide to market them? I have found that rather than competing at a farmer's market with another meat producer, that if I collaborate with them or work with them. So here's an example. In Chippewa Falls, there's a, another small um, producer, a family farm, and they raise all the same things we do. Their methods of production were slightly different. But what we would do is, I would go over and talk to her and say, what do you have extra today? Right? What do you want to sell? Uh, what do you want to get rid of? Right? And she'd say, oh, I have all this pork sausage. And I'd say, well, I don't have any pork sausage. How about when I make a sale, right, I give them your business card with some kind of deal, right? Dollar off, tube of whatever, right? A pork sausage. And that worked really well for us to cross market between us. So you can take that idea and build on it. But what that does is it shows the customers there the idea of, you know, we're all a community and they want to be part of that community. That's why they're coming to the farmer's market, a lot of them. So the more you can do to build community with your other vendors, the further off you're, the better off you're going to be. Um, all right, and then, you know, another thing is I want to spend a little bit of time on is use, use the entire animal. You know, that becomes important to our customers. We've developed a whole new market for what we call broth makers. That's the necks and backs of chickens. And on the back of a chicken, there's two little cuts of meat it's called the chicken oyster. It's the best, some of the best meat you'll have. But it makes great soup or broth, right? And it's a great source of, co of collagen with the chicken feet. And um, there hasn't been a market for chicken feet here. But we, so we started to give away chicken feet and give away broth makers. Well, we, we, we developed this market now for people who want to make soup or make bone broth. And there's all kinds of great health benefits for chicken, chicken feet. And I have to tell you, it took me a while to actually bite a chicken foot. So it took me four years to get there. And it's still a squishy memory in my mind. But there's all kinds of good stuff there. So join organizations. Don't go it alone, right? And there's a list of, of like, this organization, I encourage you, to, you're here today, join it. You'll find people with different experiences. Um, and go visit them if you can. Um, in fact, my, my representative from Rust County is here today. Nick is in the back. And um, we've done cost share with Nick's group for, for infrastructure. So I encourage you in your county, right, seek out your land and conservation person. Seek out your NRCS and USDA and FSA contacts. They're, they will help you. Share with them what you're trying to do. And there's plenty of, there's lots of cost share out there. And um, Mary, made me aware of the um, GLCI, um, which is an initiative which is up for the 2023 Farm Bill, um, and it hasn't been approved yet. And in it is all kinds of great stuff for grazers. So get out there and promote that with whomever you can, um, that they should back that part of the Farm Bill. So, um, and I think that's it, that's it. So thank you, and thank you for the extra time. And I'm gonna introduce,